So welcome to this uh, Eiffel, FOSS and OA webinar on DSpace presented by Bram Lotens from atmaya.com. Um, there's going to be about 20 minutes of presentation from Bram uh, covering um, the basics of, of what DSpace is and does and the, the latest features and those kind of things. But the majority of the session will be turned over to you and to your questions which uh, a lot of people have been filling in already on a, a Google Doc, and Bram will, will has circulated the URL for that, so I'm sure it'll pop up again during the session. So uh, do keep adding to that Google Doc during the session if more questions occur to you while he's talking, and then hopefully we can deal with those later on. Thank you, Bram. Over to you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I will now also disable uh, the webcam to make sure that uh, the bandwidth for the audio runs fine. Uh, so thank you for showing up this early on a Monday morning uh, for a DSpace seminar. Uh, as Simon mentioned, I am with uh, Atmire. I'm one of the co-founders and seven years ago we started uh, this company with the mission to provide uh, some services, installation and configuration services for people who wanted to start working uh, with DSpace. Um, so, to introduce you to the agenda, you should now see the second slide, the second slide that lists the overview of the first um, presentation. So, as Simon mentioned, this will be about 20 minutes. Uh, we will first look at the scope of DSpace as a system, uh, what's it used for, or what is an institutional repository, is all of the content in DSpace per definition open access or not. I hope to address that kind of topic for you. Then I will go into some detailed features and functionality of DSpace before introducing you to the infrastructure, the type of systems or hardware you need to start operating uh, DSpace. And then I will introduce you to the DSpace community. So DSpace is open source software, it's free. There is a non-profit organization called DuraSpace who is managing the project, but actually the bulk of the new features, the work on the documentation and some free support that is coming in through the mailing list is all provided by people like you and me, people from the international community. And I will talk a little bit about how the community is organized and how you can become a part of this. Uh, during the session, um, it will be quite hard to follow all of the questions or comments in the text chat. So while I'm speaking, it would be hard for me or Simon to follow up on those. But please go to the URL bit.ly slash dspace dash eiffel dash questions to put every question in there that you uh, encounter during the session. And we will, uh, I promise you that we will get back on those. So DSpace generally fulfills two purposes. It enables institutions to distribute publications and other digital assets online. Um, publications, while, why do I list them differently than other digital assets? That's just because publications, PDFs, docs, uh, or other types of text files are the most popular type of content uh, that's being used uh, in DSpace. But there are many examples of people uh, today using DSpace for data sets, so .zip files that contain data, uh, audio and video, or other types of uh, digital file. So there's no limit to which kind of file that you can store um, or preserve in DSpace. Uh, a second area of, of benefits or a whole different kind of purpose is not only to put these files online, but to get a good overview of um, types of activities or publications emerging in your own institution. So to give you one example, uh, when starting off a particular repository project for a university, before doing this project, it was very unclear which unit uh, was creating which publication. So some have their own websites, uh, some have access databases or Excel sheets, but by doing an institutional repository project, uh, when you're using DSpace or another software, it can be a really valuable exercise 
to centralize all of that information into a single into a single system so it's not all about technology it's also about the kind of policies open access policies or practices that you can uh, introduce to your organization with such a platform I will show you a few examples. Uh, the slides will also be shared so you will have all the links uh, so you can have a view of uh, what a DSpace looks like and which institutions are using it. Sometimes the home page is so heavily customized that it's very hard to detect that the website that you're visiting is actually a DSpace. So the University of Cambridge has added uh, an image on, on the front page and some uh, additional links that you will not see in a standard deployment of DSpace. Uh, this is another example, Harvard University. They do really a great job at keeping their repository homepage attractive by posting regular news and, and interesting tidbits of science on their homepage, really urging people to, uh, to visit again and again for, uh, for new content. Another example targeted uh, on um, information and publications concerning the, develop, uh, the development countries is uh, the Open Knowledge Repository from the World Bank. Compared to other DSpace repositories, it's a pretty new one. It was launched in April 2012, but in the meanwhile it has already racked up more than 2 million downloads and the World Bank is using it uh, as the first source of publishing uh, specific digital publications uh, including uh, the, uh, the World Development Report. Uh, this is a bit of a different use case so we've been talking about publication repositories but here the West Texas Digital Archives are an example of uh, using DSpace for images, uh, for audio, for video uh, and they also have some modules in there to allow uh, people to purchase downloads for some of them, their materials. I'm going over the examples a bit quicker to get to, um, uh, to, the, to the content and the functionality of DSpace. Um, this is an illustration of DSpace being used in Brazil uh, from a government institution, uh, the government institution that uh, governs the, the coffee production in Brazil. Uh, is using DSpace to uh, give people access to all kind of research dedicated to uh, coffee production. So it's not only academic institutions starting to use it. Uh, there's another example from the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa also has interesting resources on agriculture. And then I have, uh, I took some time to gather some uh, examples and it would be very nice to see if uh, people see their own repository in the next few slides. So if you're here and if you're seeing your own repository, just uh, put something in the text chat. This is the Ubriza uh, repository from the University of Botswana. Uh, then we have the University of Khartoum is using the DSpace JSP user interface. So, so there are two different user interfaces, JSP and XML user interface. And this is a typical example of how the JSP user interface looks like. Then there's the KNUST in Ghana. They also use the JSP user interface for DSpace. Uh, we have the Technical University of Kenya. Uh, using it for typical open access materials as their institutional repository. DSpace is also being used for uh, open education resources. So the um, African Virtual University is using it to offer courses on uh, different scientific subjects with a very heavily customized interface. Uh, we have the Nepal Library and Information Consortium. Uh, actually, I was just looking for an example from Nepal when I saw that uh, somebody from Nepal had submitted a question that will be addressed later on. And there's one particular blog post just because there are too many to list right here. DSpace is immensely popular in uh, India and uh, this person, uh, Surendra, Cheru Kodan, thank you. Uh, he has uh, listed over 50 repositories just recently in uh, August from India. 
If you want to find out more about other installations of DSpace, these are three very good resources. Uh, DuraSpace, the non-profit organization managing uh, DSpace, they have their own registry which you can browse by country, uh, by content type, by DSpace version. It's very easy to find some relevant examples. Examples are really good if you want to uh, convince the decision makers at your institution why a repository is worthwhile. Uh, nothing is as good as showing a real-life example of how that worked in practice for another institution. Uh, the Open Door and Door stands for the Directory of Open Access Repositories. is a specific list. It does not only contain DSpace repositories, but it contains a list of all repositories that are opening up um, the content of their system for open access harvesting. So it's a very good resource if you want to find specific links for OAI PMH harvesting and I will get back to that later on. And if you would like to see the data from Open Door visualized on a map, you can go to maps.repository66.org which is a mashup between Open Door data and uh, Google Maps. So if you reflect on DSpace as a software platform and if you compare it to other repositories like uh, Greenstone, ePrints or Fedora, uh, my take on the success of DSpace, while there are more than 1000 installations worldwide, is that um, if you compare it to other library systems, it's easier to use than a library catalog, especially when it comes to uh, submission. So a uh, library catalog would not be quite easy to, um, to enable submissions for other members of your institution like students or uh, faculty but in this space you're talking about pretty straightforward submission forms that anyone should be able to use anyone who's familiar with the, with the web at least but when you compare with a whole different area of systems uh, CMS stands for content management systems there we have uh, systems like uh, Drupal or Joomla um, they offer very nice functionality to submit materials to a new website as well, but um, starting them out of the box, they have less structure, um, they do not have a community or collection hierarchy, or they do not have these standardized academic submission forms in there. So even though you can build some interesting um, repository functionality into your CMS, it will take you a lot more effort to do that on a Drupal or a Joomla compared to starting off with something like DSpace. Because DSpace is a full application, if you install it, you get the web application, you get the data model, you get the solution for storing and preserving the bitstreams. Uh, this is especially an argument when you compare it to the Fedora repository system. Fedora is more like um, a system of building blocks for a repository and it will take you quite a while to get a whole web repository running when you're basing it on Fedora. There was easy, uh, early localization support, different uh, interface languages and you can install it on both Windows and Linux. Those are also reasons why DSpace has been successful. This is an example of a DSpace item page. The item is the most relevant unit of information. It's a description, uh, it's a metadata description. So you're seeing a title, an author, a URL, a date, an abstract, a description, but there are many more um, metadata fields together with uh, one or more items. It's also possible if you want to use DSpace just as a metadata archive. So files can uh, even be made optional uh, but the pros and cons on that are, are kind of a different story. So this is what a typical end user would see when he would Google for uh, an item and arrives directly on an item page. You as a librarian or any of your colleagues might be interested in the metadata fields in which this content is actually stored and you can access those through clicking on the show full item record link and this will, this will show you a page uh, like the following page, it will show you a table that clearly denotes which Dublin Core metadata field has been used to store specific information. You can also see that aside from the name of the field and the actual contents, that you see a language key for uh, the metadata fields. This is important if you are interested in uh, adopting multilingual, multilingual uh, item metadata. 
Uh, one of the reasons why uh, DSpace gets a lot of good, uh, good feedback is that this metadata scheme that you use for these items can be manipulated from the user interface. So you can access a screen uh, that's called uh, the metadata registries and in that registry you can start adding your own fields, uh, removing some of the fields that are there to make sure that it becomes more relevant to your specific use case. Uh, I'm now skipping to some features, some more features of DSpace. I'm going over them rather quickly. Of course, 20 minutes talking about DSpace is, is much too short to cover everything in detail, but please do use uh, the next 40 minutes uh, to get uh, any relevant question out there uh, that you're curious about. Uh, so the, what you're seeing right now on the slide is um, a human representation, human readable representation of the DSpace OAI interface. OAI stands for uh, the Open Archives Initiative and they have a protocol called Proto uh, Protocol for Metadata Harvesting and it's a machine readable interface that enables other systems to harvest all of the metadata from uh, their repository, from uh, your repository into their own systems. Uh, enabling, it has been enabled right from the start when DSpace got released and uh, having an OAI PMH interface is a main reason why people start uh, DSpace repositories. Another main feature is the workflow, the configurable workflow. So when you allow people to submit new items to a collection, if you uh, want to give them full freedom, you just make the items available immediately after submission. But in many contexts, especially when you are uh, allowing people to submit, um, uh, students to submit or any other uh, folks that require some review, you can enable some um, metadata quality steps where you uh, can uh, assign dedicated people to, um, to review the item before it becomes available. So there's a linear process with three steps that can be enabled or disabled, but uh, there are also features in there to write your complete, uh, your own steps or automate them uh, in some way. Since DSpace 3, there is also a dedicated mobile interface uh, that is particularly aimed at searching and browsing. So you can also get that out of the box. It works on different devices. And now, after this uh, very quick overview of functionality, I'm briefly going to say what kind of systems you need to run DSpace on. So on the lowest layer, you can run DSpace on any kind of physical server that would be a hardware server either stored in your own racks or in some data center, or you can use uh, a cloud-based uh, provider such as Amazon's uh, web services or things like Rackspace. However, if you're looking on the market of um, hosting providers, uh, you cannot host DSpace on any place where you can have a website. So DSpace requires Java and executing Java programs is often not included in the very cheapest, uh, pr uh, cheapest offers of hosting that you can find, for example, in a consumer uh, broadband subscription. So you cannot just put it in any place where you can host HTML files. On top of that web server, the physical hardware or the cloud provider, you can use any operating, uh, maybe not any operating system, but definitely Windows, uh, Solaris or any Linux distribution that can run uh, Java programs. And within your operating system, you need two more, uh, two more dependencies. So dependent software on which DSpace is dependent. That's the Apache HTTP server and the Apache Tomcat server. Uh, very strictly spoken, the Apache Tomcat server can run on its own without an Apache HTTP server. But in the most setups that we see, um, the HTTP server is put in front of the Apache Tomcat because you might have other websites or other applications running and the HTTP server is just making sure that the request arrives at Tomcat and Tomcat sends it back through the HTTP server. This is already a bit in technical detail. Please do get back to me if you have any specific uh, uh, questions about the DSpace uh, infrastructure. 
So, Simon, please interrupt me if, uh, if you find that we already have to quit now because I see that we uh, are already at 20 minutes in the session, the time that was normally reserved for the presentations. But I would just like to take a few more minutes to talk to you about uh, the DSpace community. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, presentation, the DSpace is really being developed and supported by volunteer developers all around the world, uh, including you and me. Um, it is not uh, a big ivory tower or it is not a company like Microsoft or Oracle that does uh, their own thing with the software and you as a small end user are just left looking at this whole uh, impenetrable fort. No, this is not the case how uh, the DSpace community works. Uh, a much better illustration uh, of how the DSpace community works is this, uh, this picture of a typical um, Amish barn raising. So the whole community gets together uh, to raise a new barn or to build a new house for a member of the community or for, to, for uh, use of the community in general. And you can see everybody here is working together pretty well. Uh, maybe at some point there will be someone holding a map, giving some directions on saying, well, we want to release a new version of DSpace. We want to add new features in, in a range of different areas and tries to distribute the work. But uh, the whole, there's no hierarchy or it's all a very flat structure where it ultimately comes down to um, your contributions, your own merit uh, that will earn you a place among the people who are hurt. Uh, for example, if you start helping out some people on the mailing list, even with basic questions, if you start contributing very small parts, maybe just very small bug fixes or changes, people will listen to you and they will take your uh, contribution seriously, no matter which country you're from, which culture you're from. Uh, I can really vouch for the fact that uh, the community is very diverse and that everyone's input is highly, highly appreciated. So what are the tools that are being used uh, to, to govern this community? Well, uh, the DSpace wiki uh, is an important source of information. So there's wiki.duraspace.org and there is a specific subset that has the official DSpace documentation. And then there are the DSpace mailing lists uh, where you can, uh, can subscribe and uh, enter uh, among thousands of subscribers that are listening to people's questions and, uh, and getting back to them. Uh, very briefly, DuraSpace is the non-profit governing DSpace, so they are not really the developers of the system, but they're taking care of the DSpace website, of the demo uh, site and some other uh, community activities. So, and then just very short before going into the questions, uh, Admire as a company, uh, you know, the software is free, everybody can use it even without our help, but we help institutions to install, customize, uh, maintain DSpace. We also give some trainings and we have a number of uh, commercially licensed add-on modules uh, that can add very specific functionality. So now I will enable uh, the webcam again as we are uh, ready with the slides. So maybe, Simon, uh, would you like to address uh, the questions in the document first, or do you want mm -hmm. to give people an opportunity to ask some new questions right now? I think um, if, it, if it's okay with you, Bram, thank you for the, for the presentation, by the way. It was superb. Um, the best thing for you to do, I think, would be to start dealing with the questions in the document, and then if more questions come up in the chat pane while you're doing that, I'll also add them to the to the document. So the document will keep growing while you're talking. Okay, excellent. So I will switch over to the document right now. I will not be uh, looking at the chat. So if you see something pertinent uh, coming up in the chat, Simon, please uh, jump in and uh, and point me to that. So. When I'm looking at uh, the document, there were some very interesting incoming questions uh, that I already addressed with some uh, screen shares, some screencasts. And the first question was uh, from the central OA repository in Nepal. Um, they wanted to know how they can use their repository to link to other repositories and to search other uh, repositories from their own system. And of course, there are some different approaches that you can take there, uh, but one of the easiest things that you can do and use 
is um, use the functionality that DSpace has to act as a client for OAI PMH. So we mentioned OAI PMH before as a protocol to allow people to harvest uh, your entire repository. Um, but you can also use it uh, to harvest from other repositories yourself. So there's also client functionality for OAI PMH included in DSpace. So I made a small screencast uh, that shows you how to enable this. So it basically comes down to the creation of a new collection. And in the edit collection, you can see there is a tab for content source. And if you have a normal collection, you just assume that people will submit to the collection or uh, you will do some uh, automated imports. Um, but you can also say this is not a normal collection. This is a collection linked to an external OAI PMH target. And that means that you will include the, um, the DSpace OAI request uh, URL in the edit, um, edit collection dialog. And from then on, your collection will automatically be filled with the contents of that external repository. It's an extremely powerful and sometimes uh, overlooked feature. It just works um, unless, unless there's some reservation in there. If uh, the repository you're harvesting from, if they have non-standard metadata or if they're doing very particular stuff with their metadata, uh, then it may be possible that you need to um, uh, to customize your own OAI client in, in order to harvest for them. But if you if you are a standard D space, if you're ho harvesting from another standard D space, it's definitely something easy uh, easy to use. So I don't know if the person who asked this question uh, from Nepal, if this person is present in the session, uh, so maybe in the chat. Uh, I don't know if he's happy, he or she is happy with the answer, uh, but if you have any more details to ask about this, please just put them in the Google Doc and I will uh, follow up in there. Um, going to the next question. Uh, the next question was a question about restricting access. Um, even if this space is being used for open access repositories, there's at many, at many times there is a need to restrict access to certain materials. Uh, DSpace has a system called resource policies that you can use for this purpose. Um, on the level of an individual item, you can uh, edit those policies, for example, to remove the anonymous read rights. And you can remove those read rights either for the item itself that means that people will not be able anymore to access the item page with metadata uh, without logging in. Or you can start removing the anonymous read rights on the actual files or the bundles. So a bundle is um, uh, a container for uploaded files. So the original bundle, that's the bundle that really contains the, the ones that were uploaded. And then you have a separate bundle to gather the license files and a separate bundle called text and this is a specific system bundle um, because dspace makes a .txt a text representation of each uploaded document to enable full text uh, searching so normally you will only be dealing with uh, resource policies for the files contained in the original bundle uh, there's also a screencast in the document where you can see how you can uh, enter that policy editor. It's quite powerful and also something not always uh, considered by people who start to using it. So then there was a question about uh, upgrading the software. So if you've been using DSpace in the past, for example in DSpace 1.5 and you want to upgrade to DSpace 3, can you do this? You can definitely do this and uh, there's a specific page on the DSpace documentation that deals with upgrades. It's very important there that you go over each intermediate step. So you will have, for example, a 1.5 to 1.6 upgrade, then you will have 1.6 to 1.7, 1.7 to 1.8. And the reason why you have to go through these steps of the different upgrades is because each incremental upgrade will have a script that changes the DSpace database because it assumes that certain tables or fields are present from a DSpace version. 
So it's possible that a new table has been added between 1.5 and 1.6, then the upgrade script from 1.5 to 1.6 will uh, add this table. But the problem is if you look at the upgrade script from 1.8 to 3.0, it will already assume that that table is there from version 1.6, so you cannot go straight from 1.5 to DSpace 3. There's a lot of work going on in the community to make the installation process and uh, the upgrading easier, uh, but this is the current situation. You need to go through these intermediate upgrades. Uh, there's one exception though, uh, if your DSpace is not customized, uh, it's also possible to do an entire export using the archival information package backup and restore feature. It's I would recommend you to go through the normal upgrade procedures, but if you don't want to, you can uh, play around with this AIP functionality anyway, because it's, uh, it's a very useful feature to create backups of your, uh, of your repository. So that was on the topic of upgrading. Going over to the next question before... Um, yeah, I will address everything in the document before going into the questions that enter the chat. Uh, so if you have something in the chat that is not yet in the document, please add it to the document first if you want to see it treated uh, during or after the session. Somebody asked, um, how can we upload, manage and preserve videos and group images? Uh, for me, that was kind of an open and uh, difficult question because I did not know exactly um, uh, what, what the problem was because DSpace in itself makes no distinction or supports a very wide uh, array of file, file formats and file types. So there is something called um, the Bitstream Format Registry in DSpace and that is a list that can be accessed from the user interface of all the file formats that are being supported. So if you have problems uploading a specific type of video or group image, it's possible that uh, the extension of that particular format is not added to your registry just yet. Um, so I would recommend you to go into that registry, check out if uh, the file format is there and uh, just adding, adding it there. And then people will be able to upload it uh, and to archive it as part of a DSpace item. Of course, if you search and if you look for these uh, audio or uh, video or group image types, it's possible that you want to add more interface functionality. For example, a gallery where people can browse the items looking at all of the thumbnails uh, or um, audiovisual streaming or zooming for images. And that's a different story. That's really an area of customization where you will have to change the DSpace interface and those kind of features are not provided at the moment by DSpace out of the box. But if you make something cool, for example, like um, an image slider on the DSpace front page or something else, uh, you can definitely contribute it back to the community and people will be interested, uh, may be interested to adopt the functionality that you've created. Uh, as an answer to this question, I've just um, included a few examples of people using image viewers or uh, uh, thumbnail based browsing example from a repository in Greece so maybe that can inspire you uh, to think about what you can do with uh, these non non text types so you can have videos group images uh, data sets whatever uh, I think this is the moment when we get to the questions that have been added during the seminar and I'm so happy that you have really taken this opportunity to add these additional questions. Uh, it's really great and the document will be available afterwards um, so we can really build a resource of information together. Uh, somebody asked, it's also interesting to know if you ask the question to add your name and your institution uh, there so that uh, uh, that could be valuable. So somebody asked, we will, uh, we will like to import metadata from Scopus into our directory using a CSV file. We will like the imported data to override existing data so we don't have duplicated data in the repository. Kindly show how this can be done. I'm using DSpace 1.8. Um, this is a pretty detailed question. But I'm happy to inform you that there is um, CSV editing functionality 
in the DSpace user interface. Um, so you can download a spreadsheet of items in your DSpace and I would recommend you to do that. And when you've downloaded the CSV, you have the right column headers, you have the right fields in there, and then you can work on that CSV with your Scopus data. And if you upload that CSV again, uh, you will have edits on the existing items instead of the creation of uh, duplicates. Um, CSV editing. There is some great resources by the people from uh, OSU, the um, Ohio State University. And uh, I will be adding a link, uh, a link to that, uh, to the file, uh, to the questions document later on about this uh, resource. I already have one, but I will uh, get back to this and uh, add some more relevant information. So I already linked one uh, topic in the DSpace documentation. Um, the next question would be. Would you please explain how to set up and use the statistics module for DSpace 3? I've set it up, but the downloads do not appear. Also, we'd like the statistics to be displayed for everyone, um, even if a user does not log in. Uh, two very interesting questions, um, and I will have to give some different answers to that. So first of all, DSpace statistics rely on a specific search index uh, called SOLAR, S-O-L-R, and one of the reasons why you are not seeing your statistics appear even if even though you have DSpace 3 is that you have not deployed the specific SOLAR web app. So if you do the DSpace uh, Maven and Ant builds, those are two steps in the DSpace installation, uh, you will have the possibility to deploy those uh, that SOLAR web application. So that's the first thing you need to check for. And uh, the second question is, is easier to address. Um, question was, how can we display the statistics for everyone? I believe that is a configuration setting that can be accessed uh, straight from the dspace.cfg file. And I will give you a link uh, directly to the line that you need to change. Uh, let me just check this out. Making statistics public. So the place where I go to to try to find this information, and this might be also useful to you, um, the place where this space is hosted is called uh, GitHub, and GitHub has every file from the DSpace source code. So if you ever search something, and if you have, have not DSpace installed or, or in your local directory, you can go on GitHub on this DSpace page, and you can uh, click through there. If you know your way around uh, the file, you have to know your way around the files a little bit. Um, statistics. Mm -hmm. I may, oh yeah, there it is, there it is. There is a specific configuration file called solarstatistics.cfg and there you can have some settings, but apparently the visibility setting is not in there. So I will not be able to find that uh, very quickly, so I will just get back to this answer. Uh, and uh, give you the link to the right file to change that. So first thing, check if your solar web application is running. And the second thing, there is one specific setting that will allow people to view your uh, statistics anonymously. And I will get back to you later on. Uh, somebody asks, can you document the installation process of the latest DSpace in Ubuntu and Windows? Um, very good question, because if you go to the standard installation page, um, it's usually it's a little bit thin on very specific um, very specific system environments 
So uh, I know of an institution, the University of Stellenbosch, and they have super resources on uh, installation on Ubuntu. It's uh, amazing how good their documentation is. And if I can remember just where it's stored. Uh, okay, I've got it right here. So this is just an example of how the community works together. So even if those people are not paid, they made some great resources on how uh, to install DSpace in Ubuntu. And there was an Indian institution that has made a very good resource on installing DSpace on Windows. And those. I'll just quickly try to find that one for you. And I've got that right here. So that's a, a guide. The guide is made for DSpace 1.7, so you will you will need to compare it to the standard uh, installation instructions for DSpace 3.0. Uh, but it gives you an overview of screenshots of things you need to go through because the the actual installation process on Linux and on Windows is not that different. Uh, you will need uh, things like Ant, Maven and uh, Java and a Postgres database, but how you install those dependencies, how you install Maven, how you install Tomcat, um, those procedures are very different on a Windows machine compared to Linux. So I hope that this, uh, these two resources can really help you here. Uh, Henry Atsu Agbodza from the University of Ghana asks you, Bram, the wiki points to the unreleased version DSpace 4. Uh, that's true. We're already preparing the DSpace uh, 4 release. So there are different environments uh, for DSpace 3 documentation and DSpace 4 documentation. And I will give you uh, the two separate links so you can clearly see the difference uh, between those two. So it's on the same subsite, so it's called the Confluence Wiki. And uh, we are one thing that I'm personally doing to the DSpace 4 documentation is the whole hierarchy of pages is changing uh, dramatically. So the DSpace 3 documentation hierarchy, the difference between using, installing and finding the right page is quite difficult. So we hope that the hierarchy of the pages within the DSpace 4 documentation will be a lot clearer. And now you've asked about DSpace 4, I also wanted to say that the next release, so the DSpace 4 release is expected for uh, early December, so I think we are scheduled for the 3rd or the 4th of December and we should have the first release candidate version ready this week for testing. So if you want to start play around with uh, DSpace 4, if you want to do some testing, uh, that would be really great. Somebody is asking, how can we migrate our resources to DSpace? We were using Joomla for content management. Uh, a good question, it's quite of an open question because how you migrate your resources uh, depends primarily on the format you can get it into. So if you can get to a spreadsheet format for your metadata, you can use the features for CSV editing and, um, and adding items that I've already listed, uh, listed above. I will copy the link again in the answer. If you can get the file into CSV, you can use CSV editing features. Uh, if you cannot get it into CSV, but if you can get it into XML, uh, that means you can use something called uh, the simple, the simple item ingester or the simple item ingest format. I always forget the name. It's quite, uh, it's quite dense. Item import. That's the moment when even I have to look for uh, use the search feature in DSpace. Here it is importing and exporting items via the simple archive format. So the simple archive format 
comes down to a structure of files on your file system. So it's a folder and it has a subfolder for every item. And for every item, you will have an XML file that will contain the metadata in a specific format and you will have a subfolder that contains the actual files, so the PDFs. So you're keeping the metadata in XML, the files in a subfolder, and then you have a, a series of scripts that can uh, go through this entire directory structure and import that for you into DSpace. If you cannot get it into CSV, if you cannot get it into XML, and if you're just saying, well, we have a bunch of resources, but they are in an unstructured format on a website, um, then I would really recommend you try to get it into CSV, try to get it into XML, because it would be possible that then your only next step is to use uh, the DSpace submission forms and, and just submit it one by one into, uh, into the repository. Uh, the next question was, where can I get genuine installation notes of DSpace? This is already partially uh, covered with the direct links to DSpace 3 and 4. So from these pages, you can find a page called installation. I'm just pasting the direct link to the documentation there again. And those are the official installation resources. Uh, Sandra Hassan SPLI from Mauritius is asking, from a beginner's point of view, how can I run DSpace on my PC with Windows system as operating system or can it only be run on a server? Um, that also relates to the question of the installation procedure on Windows. Uh, so I will post the PDF again on how you do it there. Uh, I also have a resource on which kind of hardware you need to run DSpace. And um, in essence, DSpace can run on any type of, of uh, PC or laptop. The only difference is when you start to use it as a server for other people to use, you will have some requirements regarding storage to store all your items or memory to make sure that your uh, application runs fast enough. And we have some recommendations there on uh, what kind of sizing you can use for your server. Um, and that would be a good resource to check out. Following question comes from Henry Atsu Agbodza from the University of Ghana. And he asks how to modify the names of fields, display to submission users, and then show to anonymous users who visits your repository. And then, sh and then those shown to anonymous users who visit your repository. Um, good questions. The, let me tackle the first thing, um, the configuration of your, um, of your input forms, the forms you use to submit uh, to DSpace. It's a different story than the final display for, uh, for people. So the first thing that I'm showing you is a file called inputforms.xml and that is one XML file that uh, manages the, um, the submission process. And this file is very interesting because if you compare the two uh, user interfaces for DSpace, so you have JSP user interface based on JSP technology and XML uh, user interface, the input forms.xml is something used by both user interfaces. It's a very rare thing because the other uh, user interface elements are usually split. But if you do any configuration in this file, you will, um, you will see the effects both in the XML user interface and the, the JSP one. I'm also giving one example uh, of one particular field and you will see that in the, um, in the XML file, you have a container called fields. And there you have, first of all, the metadata description of uh, which field you will use to store what people submit. So that's a DC uh, contributor author, for example. And then where you change it is called the label. And um, if you change the label, it will change in the interface. Uh, let me just put a comment in there. Changing the label will change the field description for the submitter. Right. 
the second thing is a bit more difficult. Uh, how do I change which fields are being shown to the end user who visits the items? Uh, in this case, it's a different story for uh, JSP and for XML UI, and it's a bit too detailed to go into here. But what I will do for you is uh, changing item pages in XML UI. and changing item pages in JSP UI. And I will get back to you with an explanation uh, in the document uh, later on. Maybe not today, but uh, in one of the next days. Going further, there's been a huge amount of questions. Thank you very much for the interest. Um, Henry is asking again how to add new fields, add them to the submission workflow and then display them to anonymous users. I think that's the same question as the one we just answered. Um, Simon is asking, are we happy to run over uh, time a little bit? No problem at all. So we will just keep going uh, until you tell me to stop, Simon. And um, in any case, I will continue work on this file and uh, you can have some uh, add some more questions in there. But um, Further, if you have more questions, let's say next week or in uh, in future weeks to come, the best resource to go to is uh, the DSpace mailing list. And I'll just add uh, another question: question where to find the DSpace mailing lists for free support? And I will add the answer myself. Uh, let me just because the dspace.org website was recently renewed um, so you can go on the website to resources and then community and then join the community mailing list And you can ask any type of question uh, and people will be very responsive and very friendly. Uh, the only thing you need to be aware of is if you don't get a question immediately, don't start to write three or four emails with the same question because then you will annoy people um, if they see the question coming in in multiple emails. And also try to make your question as specific as possible uh, so people can point you to the right resource. So, for example, a bad question would be, I just uh, installed DSpace and it is not working, please help. So, if you ask a question like that, people will not be able to assess your situation or give you any relevant advice. So, give some screenshots, uh, some Java server errors or anything and, uh, and you will get very, very good response on those mailing lists, I promise you. Tatiana Zaizeva from Baku is asking, how can we add... Um, to the repository movie video and groups of pictures I think there's a variation of the question that was already addressed before uh, so as I mentioned uh, you can upload any type of file in DSpace and I can see that you could have some challenges if the files are becoming pretty big because if a file is big uh, it will mean that uploading it through the user interface especially on a low bandwidth connection could be quite of a challenge uh, so if you need a solution for bigger files, uh, then you can ask people to provide them the files directly to you on a USB drive on a CD and you upload them from uh, the local network. Um, but on the level of the platform itself, it could be that you need to do some configuration, but there is no limit, no software technical limit of the file size in DSpace. So you can have files that are a gigabyte, multiple gigabytes, but especially on Windows servers or on other operating systems, um, it could be difficult to do files that are bigger than four gigabytes. Uh, so then you need a specific approach. Someone asks, how do we update our DSpace to version three? Uh, we have upgrade. We have addressed upgrading before. Uh, so I will just uh, create an anchor link. I think that is possible to link it to something that happened earlier. Um, 
I don't see how that I can do, how I can do that immediately. But in any case, we have addressed upgrading before. Uh, are all of these answers applicable to all versions of DSpace or only version 3 is another question from Henry Atsu Agboza. Uh, a good question. Um, in most cases I am talking about version 3 but most of the features that I've described so far they were already present in older versions of DSpace. For example when we talked about the CSV editing of metadata, this is a feature that was added in DSpace 1.6. If we're talking about the AIP export and imports, uh, that's something added in version 1.8, if, if I'm not mistaken. And the simple item Im import and exports, remember uh, those about the XML files and the file structure, they have been existing for, uh, for as long as I can remember. But in any case, I would really recommend you to upgrade to the latest version because you will benefit from so many bug fixes and new features um, and, and also from help in the community because if you're asking, if you're confronted with a particular bug and if you get the answer, oh, this has been solved in DSpace 1.8, nobody will give you a very specific uh, fix or a patch for your uh, situation and they will just assume that you will be upgrading to the latest version. Alej Bezogi, Osak, Polor, Christopher from Nigeria asks, how do I configure Tomcat to change from port 80, 8080 to port 80 by using our own URL? Uh, a bit of a technical detail question, but a very interesting one nonetheless. And uh, remember when I showed the slides that I told you that uh, you can run Tomcat straight away, but you can also put an HTTP server in front of it usually putting Apache in front of, um, uh, of Tomcat will help you but it's also possible to do that with Tomcat straight away and uh, there is a specific page that um, that gives you feedback on this and the page is called dspace on standard ports I will just give you uh, a link right away And this link shows you a, a few different uh, ways of how to accomplish this. It's uh, not a DSpace specific, um, how would I say, instruction, but it's uh, just a general answer on how, how can I run Tomcat applications on a standard port so that it's possible that there are other resources on the internet that give you uh, more specific details. Jolanta Kahn from the LCC International University is asking, we are considering DSpace for an institutional repository. How can I predict the growth of the repository when everything is published electronically in these days? What size of the server is needed for a beginning and in a year? Very good question and uh, something that is... Um, something that is troubling for a lot of people because if you have no experience running a repository you cannot look at the past or you cannot assess uh, your previous usage but I can give you some general pointers if you're dealing with text-based data if you're dealing with PDFs you can assume that a PDF is roughly below five, uh, 5 megabytes excuse me uh, so if you're extrapolating and, and uh, calculating with worst case scenarios, uh, you can just calculate and have a big, big error margin on, on how big you go because overdimensioning your server is always less of a problem than underdimensioning your server, especially because um, cloud providers like Amazon EC2 or... Uh, EC2 or um, even a Dell server, they are providing pretty powerful servers at, at, good, uh, at a good cost nowadays. So you just need to calculate uh, a bit on the high end. So let's say that you want to calculate for 20,000 PDFs uh, each of 5 megabytes. Uh, so t 
so that that's only if you have uh, if you have that kind of amount you will only amount to uh, to 100 gigabyte twen even if you have 20,000 publications each of five PDFs uh, each of five megabytes you will only need a hundred gigabyte and if you see that uh, normal disks in servers are now being sold at terabytes is just if you have a DSpace server if you put in one drive of a terabyte I'm sure that for 80% of the institutional repositories you will cover the storage needs for the first few years but it becomes a different story if you open up your system to audio to video to data sets and that is the tricky question that you need to ask yourself what kind of files will we allow and uh, how can we make the right dimension or the right calls in that area but just as a general recommendation over dimensioning is always better than under dimensioning Yao Ba Mwako from Ghana asks, we ran Ubuntu for our servers here at the Catholic University and I'm wondering how we can install it. Um, and it has already been answered by somebody else and uh, also there's a link higher up in the document uh, that gives very specific Ubuntu instructions. See link above for Ubuntu instructions. Another question from Tatiana Zaiseva from Baku. Is it possible to customize your themes? Uh, good question. Customization of your look and feel of DSpace or customizing for the XML user interface is very different compared to customizing for JSP user interface. So the XML user interface comes with the very nice feature that you can have separate themes for separate collections just by way of configuration. Uh, I will give you a link to a detailed resource there, but I have to warn you, the learning curve for XML UI customization is uh, pretty steep. If you, um, if you have no specific skills yet with uh, XML and XSLT, the XSLT is the XML style sheet transformation um, language but I also have a resource called uh, a primer on XML UI uh, customization and I will also share that link with you directly. Let me see if I can quickly find it. The XML UI primer that is something you need um, but in XML UI a lot is being done in uh, CSS so if you're just talking about changing colors adding a few logos uh, it's just the matter of changing a few CSS files so that part is pretty easy but if you start to move around specific areas of the page to other areas or you want to add new sections of the page uh, then you're talking about um, XML and XSLT transformations while it is a bit, bit more straightforward in JSP because JSP just requires you to edit and change the JSP files. Uh, Vyacheslav Brichov, Brichovsky from Belarus asks what books on this space could you recommend? Um, as far as I know there is no updated book on this space uh, right now and DSpace 4 is going to be released at the end of the year there are going to be a lot of changes, a lot of interesting new features so any book that you would buy today on DSpace 3 will be um, uh, will be outdated uh, within the next few months but uh, there is good information on the DSpace wiki so the DSpace uh, direct links to the documentations that I've already listed to the document before and if you want to have more information on uh, what's coming for DSpace 4, I have the link to the release notes page. And on that release notes page, you can already discover um, a lot of the new features that have been added. Joseph Longshack from CBN Library Nigeria asks how do I configure the system to index full text please screenshots if possible um, 
Good question. The full text indexing in DSpace is managed through a process called media filters. So media filters are is a group name for um, processes that will go over all of the files in DSpace and process them um, in a way specific to the file type. To give you one concrete example, media filters will take a PDF file, uh, generate a text and index that text for full text indexing. But that's not the only thing. Uh, media filters will also go over image files and um, create thumbnails of those images. And I will give you a link directly to the media filter system. So it mainly comes down to making sure that you execute the right filter media uh, media filter script. And I've given you the page directly for DSpace 4, but nothing has been changed to the media filter system, so it should be usable. If you have specific problems with uh, running these scripts or enabling the full text, please uh, feel free to contact me and uh, or on the mailing list, and I will be happy to help you. Uh, somebody asked, please can you repeat what you said in your presentation about metadata and schemas? I would be happy to repeat this, but I'm just uh, going to cut and paste your question to the end to make sure that the people who have already understood this, uh, that they don't have to listen to this twice. So your question is not gone. I've just taken it and uh, copied it to the end of the, pre to the, end of the document. Uh, Mandia Nidaya from Senegal is, please can you repeat again why DSpace is easier than Fedora and ePrints? Uh, stupid question, do you speak French? We are in project of putting up an open access repository and we need expertise in French. Um, I again, like for the previous question, I will uh, talk again about comparing DSpace to Fedora and ePrints at the end of the questions. Uh, and Simon is also noting that the recording of the session will be available uh, afterwards. Uh, we do speak French at Admire, so we're in Belgium. Belgium is bilingual, so my French is not as good as my English, but we, have, we are running a few uh, projects in France. Uh, here is one of our French clients. So one of our clients is the RMT Paris Tech Institution in Paris, and for them we have created this uh, SUM repository. Chukwuma Uhuoke from Nigeria asks, please, how do we resolve our URL to simply read um, dspace.unn.edu.ng instead of the port 8080 uh, slash GSP UI. Very relevant question and I have already answered it uh, above. So it comes down to making sure that your Tomcat application runs on a standard port and we have a specific information resource on that. So I hope this helps you to uh, fix this. Is it possible to have this kind of seminars in Russian or maybe more text materials in Russian? Um, good question. I don't speak Russian, but um, I can put some links here for uh, these spaces or from people that are using these space in Russia. And I also know that there are a lot of good uh, skilled people running these space into some neighboring countries of Russia and maybe those people speak Russian as well to do um, add relevant Russian examples 
Derip Erget from Addis Abeba, Ethiopia is asking, can we use DSpace for large digital books as a repository? Uh, the answer is yes. There is no limit, as I mentioned, there is no limit to the file size that you can put in DSpace, so you can go up to a gigabyte, uh, up to four gigabytes. I would be interested to see your book format uh, that has multiple gigabytes in one file. Um, but um, that would be hard for people to, uh, to download and to access, but definitely it's not a problem. Um, it would be interesting if you index them as PDF and if the PDF, if you're scanning these books, it would be handy if your uh, scanned pages are scanned with an OCR software. And if you um, upload OCR PDFs, it's possible that DSpace can uh, do the filter media and also offer full text searching on these PDFs. So that's a good, a good suggestion. Uh, Nicolas Kamuzime from Uganda is asking, can DSpace detect a duplicate record when depositing it in an institutional repository? This functionality is not offered out of the box. So it's, uh, it's definitely a good idea and um, we have implemented something similar as part of our uh, metadata quality module. Um, so the key thing is uh, when do you consider something a duplicate for your repository or not because it might seem like an, uh, an easy question but the answer can be, can be tricky. For example, if I'm a researcher and I have a certain paper, it's possible that I want to add the paper as an item in this space but also uh, a presentation that I gave about the paper. So one item will be the paper itself and another item will be a PowerPoint presentation about it. Of course, you can have the two files, the PowerPoint and the PDF in the same item. So you have to decide what your policy will be on uh, files that are very similar and which kind of checks that you can automate to, um, to detect those duplicates. Will you just look at the title? Will you look at the title or the author? Will you only consider titles if the text distance there are algorithms to use this to say, okay, when a title matches another title for 80%, I will consider it a duplicate. So there are different ways to tackle this, uh, but it's not offered as a default feature of this space. Um, I've now uh, come to these last questions that were already addressed before, so I will repeat them, but um, for people who are not interested anymore in these last two questions, so repetition about the metadata and the schemas and about comparing DSpace to Fedora and ePrints, so if you don't want to hear that, I just want to, uh, I want to read the chat a little bit and I want already to say goodbye to the ones uh, of you all who may have to run to the next meeting or the next activity. Uh, so there's been a lot of activity in the chat. Uh, some questions were already reported in the document. Um, and again, for those that already want to sign off, I want to thank you for your attendance, thank you for your interest in DSpace. Please do sign up on the mailing lists uh, and you will find that you will enter a, a very international community with participants from all over the world that are very open to help you and that of course expect that if you receive help when you are new to this space that you will also become a member of the community and that you will start uh, to do whatever you can in your time uh, to, to help people maybe with some basic questions or some more things uh, where you have been advanced. So to go over a few of these questions again, um, what did I say in the presentation about metadata and schemas? Uh, so out of the box, DSpace uses the, a derived schema from the original 15 Dublin Core elements. So the Dublin Core uh, original schema starts with the namespace DC. So you have DC dot contributor and then a possibility to add a qualifier. Uh, dspace.contributor.author or dspace.contributor.editor. Um, in my presentation, what I covered is that um, dspace has an advantage over other systems because you can manipulate the schema from within the user interface. So you can uh, click in the user interface and go to edit uh, schema. 
and there you can uh, decide to add fields to remove fields and then later on using input forms.xml you can uh, add these fields to your uh, to your entry forms uh, what I can add on this subject is that um, the 15 original fields from Dublin Core uh, they are not the latest version of the Dublin Core standards so nowadays Dublin Core recommends a schema called um, DC terms and not called uh, DC and what they are doing the most important move from going to uh, from going from the DC namespace to the DC terms namespace is the fact that they are dropping the whole system of the qualifiers because qualifiers are actually reducing the amount of information you get if you harvest without the qualifiers this sounds very abstract let me clarify this to you with an example let's say that I have an item and uh, it's a student's thesis so you have a few fields called dc.contributor.author uh, you have dc.contributor.reviewer uh, uh, and dc.contributor. Um, how do you call somebody who uh, provides guidance during a PhD supervisor so you have dc.contributor.supervisor if people will harvest your repository using the simple DC fields the only thing that they will get is the contents of the fields and the, the simple field name so they will only get dc.contributor so even though you have the specific qualifiers DC contributor author supervisor reviewer those qualifiers will be split off and will not be offered uh, to the harvesting interface and if you think that's a problem for uh, contributors think about this problem if you're dealing with different dates you're saying dc.date.published dc.date.embargo lifted uh, if you're dropping those qualifiers you really lose a lot of information so dspace as a community we know this and we know that the the newer scheme the dc term schema solves this just by having a bunch more uh, fields without qualifiers so instead of having something called dc.date available for the availability date there's a field in dc terms called dc terms dot available so just a straight field without um, uh, without that particular qualifier um, and we have already added a dc terms schema to the newest release of dspace to dspace 4 but it will not be enforced yet on everyone so during the development uh, during the usage of dspace 4 people can start to uh, decide whether they want to migrate to dc terms or not or just use the standard old uh, standard dc field names so i hope that was not too much in detail i will go over to the question from uh, mandia Nidae from Senegal can you repeat again why dspace is easier than Fedora and ePrints so what I said earlier is um, there's a big difference in adopting dspace versus Fedora because dspace is a turnkey application if you do the installation procedure you will have a fully functional repository you will have the web application you will have the harvesting interface you will have the submission interface you will have searching browsing statistics everything when you are using Fedora or when you install Fedora you have a system of software building blocks to build a repository uh, in Fedora you can ask yourself questions like what kind of content models do I want to build and you will build these content models as part of the software and then you will go into a system of building a user interface for your Fedora repository so on average doing a dspace starter project is maybe a few weeks or a few months there are a lot of fedora projects that run multiple years to start up um, obviously i am uh, simplifying things a little bit and there are a few uh, user interfaces available for fedora so for example there's a thing called islandora where uh, drupal is being linked up as the front end for the fedora backend but still uh, from those users that use Islandora uh, I get the feedback that they find uh, this uh, more complicated than using dspace dspace is a simpler tool than Fedora 
Comparing DSpace and ePrints is a different story because just like DSpace, ePrints is a turnkey application. Some people even say that ePrints is more easy to install than DSpace. And uh, it depends on which background you have. What you do have to know is that the technology used to build ePrints is very different from the technology used to build DSpace. DSpace is a Java-based application, so if you have somebody in your team who has Java experience, they will be very comfortable uh, manipulating uh, DSpace code. But ePrints is built on uh, Perl, Perl scripts, and Perl scripts are, uh, or that technology is not that common anymore in uh, people's experience. But in itself, the ePrints is a turnkey application. It's quite good. It's easy to install. So uh, I would definitely recommend you to take a close look at ePrints as well, because it's maybe possible that uh, that you will like ePrints better. Um, a big additional difference is that the community uh, behind ePrints is very different than the DSpace community. The DSpace community is very big internationally while the ePrints community is more UK-centric, it's more centered around the development going on at the University of Southampton. But still, after DSpace, I think ePrints is the second biggest community anyway, but uh, uh, it's a different, um, different situation. Uh, somebody asks, how does DSpace differ from Greenstone and what is the ideal one? I would be happy to get your views. Um, uh, of course, I work for a DSpace company, so my views are obviously biased and I can only say the ideal repository really depends on what you want to do with it. So your, your use case or your ambitions or your vision on the repository will, will define your requirements and your requirements define what the best system is for you. And for Greenstone in specific, I, I have no experience with Greenstone at all. Um, so I cannot really compare those two. So um, I would be happy to look into Greenstone at some other time, but right now I cannot give you a good sense on uh, what the pros and cons are for comparing DSpace with Greenstone. Um, but I see that Simon or someone else from Eiffel has already uh, contributed an answer to this question, so that will be, uh, uh, that will be quite good as well. So we're at the end of the document, we're also at the end of this uh, session, we're getting some good feedback in here. Somebody asks where can I get the DSpace software to install, I will just answer this last thing in the chat and maybe there are some uh, remarks that you want to add uh, Simon. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, staying around and answering all those questions so fully and so helpfully. Um, what we'll do is try and just tidy that document up a little bit and then send it out to everybody along with the uh, recording link. And I think it'll be a really useful, rich resource for everybody. So thank you very much. Thank you for going over time and uh, persevering with all the questions because there were uh, a very pleasing number of questions. And as I said, thank you for the yeah, very I mean detailed information. If you compare this to an academic session with uh, a lot of students <coughs> sitting in an auditorium, you're usually already happy if one or, God forbid, two people uh, dare to put up a question. But here it seems like the Google document worked very well for everyone to lower the threshold. And I'm very happy that I could engage with you because it means that you find the content interesting and that just makes uh, my time worthwhile to do this for you guys. Absolutely. So again, thank you very much from myself and from Irina, of course, who's <coughs> currently on a plane somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere, so she couldn't be here today. But we, we really appreciate your help and really appreciate a, a really fantastic session. Thank you. I shall end okay. the recording. Thank you very much, guys.